Wow, isn't that something? The things we learn from thoroughly studying the Bible, God will show us amazing things. I know that this is a very, very different picture from what mainstream Christianity has led us to believe. But learning Scripture, God's way, is so much more clear. So much more clear. But we are not done yet. Now let's go way back to the very controversy that clashed between good and evil. The book of Revelation is not necessarily just a book about prophetic events that take place in the future. It is more so a book that reveals Jesus Christ. Hence the name, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We have learned from the interpretation of the prophecies given to us in the film From Babylon to America that the book of Revelation gives us insights on the past as well as the future. God gives us prophecy in the backdrop of past events to let us know the foundation of future events that reveal the mission of Jesus Christ for the purpose of our preparation of His second coming. In Revelation 12, John gives us a sneak peek of the war that happened in heaven of all places. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So there was a war in heaven between the good and the evil. The Greek word that John used for the word war was the word polemos. In English, we have the word polemic, which means a rant or an exchange of words or a verbal war, which is pretty much how most physical wars start, by an exchange of some kind of combative communication. There must have been a verbal war that turned into a physical one in heaven. What was being communicated? Now, just from the whole outlook of the Bible, we see the great controversy being played out all over the book. The very title, Satan, means accuser. Who was he accusing, and what were the accusations? Well, all throughout Scripture, God had mainly been the target of the accusations of the devil. In Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5, And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the trees of the garden, but of the fruits of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The enemy was trying to indirectly accuse God in this scenario because he was painting the picture that God was restrictive, manipulative, and that God was a liar. The enemy says that if we sin, we will become like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, we don't need God to tell us what's right and what's wrong. We will know what's good and what's evil, or we can make our own rules. We can declare what is good and what is evil. In Job chapter 1, we see the enemy again making accusations towards God. When God had called upon a heavenly council, Satan showed up unannounced from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him? Put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. What was Satan accusing God of? Satan is saying that Job only worships God because he gives him stuff. Now in the Bible, a star is a symbol for an angel according to Revelation 1 and verse 20. Satan's deception and accusation about God must have been so powerful that even Revelation 12 and verse 4 says that he drew a third of the stars or 
angels of heaven and was cast down with him to earth. Since God knows everything and since God knew that Satan's rebellion would result to the sin of mankind, why didn't God just zap Satan out of existence before he could get to mankind or even right when he was trying to persuade a third of the angels about God? Let's really think about this. The enemy has just gone around heaven campaigning against God. He was making these wild accusations about God saying he's restrictive and manipulative and that he is a liar. We even see motives of his heart written in Isaiah 14 when God was talking to Satan, the power behind the king of Babylon. He says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. This was the motive of Satan. He wanted to be exalted and he wanted to be like the Most High. In other words, he wants to be worshipped. So if God knew that sin was going to happen, how come he didn't stop it before it sprung up? And when Satan did start campaigning against God, how come God didn't just zap him out of existence to make an example out of him? Now there is no doubt that God is infinitely more powerful and infinitely more wiser than any being out there, but it seems like he just let it happen. Why? First of all, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and neither are our ways his ways. He is infinitely more powerful and wiser than us and perhaps this is precisely why he let sin happen. Maybe he knows what he is doing. Ezekiel 28 illustrates the perfection of the anointed covering cherub who is Lucifer. He was one of the angels that was the closest to God out of all the angels. He was a beautiful and perfect being until sin was found in him. Sin sprung up spontaneously. In fact, the Bible even calls it the mystery of iniquity. It is a mystery. It cannot be explained. If we were able to explain how sin spontaneously occurred, then sin could be excused. But we know that sin cannot be excused. We have no idea how a perfect being like Lucifer could have started sinning. An infinitely loving God created a whole host of creatures with the freedom to choose either to love, worship, and obey their creator or not. If it wasn't Lucifer, it would have been someone else. In Matthew 25, Jesus was talking about the second coming and he says something very interesting. Those who are good, they will inherit the kingdom that was prepared for them. Now check out what Jesus has to say to the wicked. Verse 41, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So this everlasting fire was prepared originally for the devil and his angels. But since the wicked took part of sin, they also will be cast into the everlasting fire. But originally, it was prepared only for the devil and his angels angels. Now remember, Lucifer has been campaigning against God ever since iniquity was found in him. Again, how come God didn't just kill Lucifer and throw him into the lake of everlasting fire right then and there? Imagine if the Vice President of the United States of America started campaigning against President Trump. What if the Vice President went around slandering President Trump and then all of a sudden he gets killed without a fair trial? Who would the citizens of America suspect as the one behind the killing? None other than President Trump. Now think about that for a minute. Lucifer has just gone around campaigning against God, saying God is not really the loving God we believe him to be, and that he is restrictive and manipulative and a liar, and Lucifer's deception was so persuasive that even some of the angels are now entertaining the idea that maybe Lucifer has a point, and then all of a sudden, God kills Lucifer without a fair trial. The universe would then think that maybe Lucifer was onto something. And so now, God has a mess in his hands and he has to be careful about what he does next and the way that he deals with sin. Of course, if God wanted to, he can just punish Satan right then and there 
throw him in the lake of fire because God knows the heart of Satan and God knows the motive of Satan and he knows that Satan's rebellion would lead to something really, really terrible. See, God knows everything, but the heavenly angels don't know everything. So before Satan is punished, there must first be a trial or a judgment process. The angels must first be 100% sure that Satan deserves the punishment because if God just all of a sudden destroyed Satan without a fair trial, then it would develop in the minds of the angels the seed of suspicion towards God. Revelation 12 and verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now in John 12, right before Jesus was going to be taken and crucified, listen to what he says. Now the prince of this world, the devil, shall be cast out. But wait a minute, I thought he was already cast out. Yes, but not fully because again we read in Job chapter 1 that he still had somewhat of an access to heaven. But when Jesus was crucified, that was when Satan was cast out fully because the heavenly angels saw the fruits of Satan's rebellion and that his rebellion led to the death of the Son of God whom the heavenly angels loved so dearly. In 1 Peter 1, Peter talks about how the Old Testament writers and prophets prophesied about salvation and about the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, giving us a grace period and telling us about the glory that should follow. Peter then says that those things were revealed to the Old Testament writers so that when we read them, it will minister unto us. By them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So not only are the angels involved in this great controversy, they are also watching how God solves this sin problem. They are also watching how God will give us salvation. The heavenly angels desire to look into these things. Colossians 1, talking about the preeminence of Christ. Paul says that not only earth, but even heaven needed to be reconciled. And Jesus did that by offering himself as the sacrifice and spilling his blood on the cross. And so when the angels saw that Satan's rebellion caused the death of Jesus Christ and his blood to be spilled on the cross, the minds of them in heaven are now reconciled. The devil caused the murder of Jesus Christ and judging by the law, which is the Ten Commandments, murder is a sin and is punishable by death. Now the angels are 100% sure that God had been right all along about the enemy. I mean, of course they knew and they had faith that God had always been right about Satan, but when they saw the death of Christ caused by Satan's rebellion, that was the proof they needed to say as a jury that Satan deserves the death penalty. Satan is marked and now he is sealed for death along with his evil angels because they sided with him in plotting to murder Jesus Christ. Now we will notice that there are four stages of the judgment process. Some people say three but I notice four stages of the judgment process. This is only the first stage of the judgment. And this stage is to assure the heavenly angels that Satan and his angels deserve the punishment of death. So now that the heavenly angels are reconciled about Satan and his angels, and now that the death of them is sealed, what is God waiting for? He is waiting for us. Matthew 16 and verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Revelation 22 and verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Christ will return to give rewards. What is this reward that will come at the end that the Bible is talking about, and who are they for? Proverbs 13 and verse 13, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Psalm 18 and verse 20, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. 
Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Bible says that the righteous will be rewarded. What will their reward be? Isaiah 62 and verse 11, Behold thy salvation cometh, behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. John 10 verses 27 and 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Romans 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the Bible, the reward of the righteous will be salvation and eternal life. Will there be a reward for the wicked? Deuteronomy 32 verse 41 If I wet my glittering sword, and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. 2 Samuel 3 and verse 39 The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Proverbs 26 and verse 10, The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. So the Bible says that the wicked will also get a reward, but what will their reward be? Job 21 says that God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him and he shall know it. His eyes shall see his destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Romans 3 verses 16 through 18, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Philippians 3 verses 18 and 19, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So the reward of the righteous is eternal life, and the reward for the wicked will be the punishment of destruction. We already know that these rewards will be given at the second coming of Christ. In order for these rewards to be given, something must first happen to determine which of us will get which reward. We know this because Revelation 22 and verse 12 says that it is according to our works which reward we get. How does the Bible determine this? Psalms 58 verses 10 and 11. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Psalm 94 says, O God to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render a reward to the proud. Job 21 and verse 22, shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high. Revelation 11 says, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. In order for the rewards to be properly distributed, there must first be a judgment to determine who gets which reward. Remember, God knows everything, but the angels don't know everything. So in order to reconcile the angels of heaven, we also need to be put on trial to see which of us can enter heaven and which of us cannot. That way, the angels can be sure that God is right, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is Come. The Bible specifically states that the hour of God's judgment is come while the everlasting gospel is still being preached 
around the world. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 8 through 10. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, we must ask a few questions. We know that the Bible says when we die, we stay in the grave until the resurrection and that there must be a judgment before the resurrection when the rewards are given. How then will we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ? How will the dead appear before the judgment seat of Christ when they are still in the grave? How will the living appear before the judgment seat of Christ when they are still living their lives on earth, receiving and preaching the everlasting gospel? we must first learn the process of judgment. First of all, how will we be judged? Isaiah 33 verse 22, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our law giver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. James 2 verses 11 and 12, For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now I do not believe that we are saved by keeping the law. I do, however, believe that keeping the law is a natural response when we have a loving relationship with God, and God initiated that love by sending His Son to die in our place. When we truly realize what God has done for us, the response should be to repent and obey God. And what is there to obey if it isn't His Ten Commandments? The Bible says in Isaiah and in James that we are judged according to the law, just like Satan and his angels were judged according to the law. Now remember that chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians says that every man will receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. 1 Peter 1 verses 16 and 17, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. God keeps a record of our actions in heaven. He records all of our actions. Matthew 12 verses 35 through 37. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. God keeps a record of our words that we will give account thereof in the day of judgment. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God even keeps a record of every single one of our secret deeds. There must be a record of everyone's lives in heaven. Is this biblical? Is there anything else in the Bible that confirms this? Revelation 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is how we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will not appear physically because we know that the Bible says when we die, we do not resurrect until we are judged before the second coming of Christ. We will appear before the judgment seat of Christ by the records of our lives written in the books and God will judge our deeds according to the law. Where does the judgment 
take place. 1 Peter 4 and verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Psalms 9 says that he hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. So before the dead and those who are alive are given their rewards, judgment must first take place. Judgment begins at the throne of God in heaven in which the books are opened, exposing the written transcript of our lives so that our lives can be judged. All the while, the gospel is being preached around the world. The hour of God's judgment has now come. It is happening right now as the gospel is being preached. 2 Samuel 14 and verse 20, And my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. John 21 verse 17, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, The third time lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. 1 John 3 and verse 20, For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and knoweth all things. There are countless passages in the Bible that let us know the infinite knowledge of God. God knows all things. So then, what is the judgment for? What is a judgment for a God who knows everything about us, even secret things? Is there another purpose for the judgment and why it needs to take place? 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. The Greek word that Paul used for the word spectacle is the word theatron which means theater. The earth has been made a theater, not only to man, but to angels as well. Now don't forget that God knows everything, but the angels don't know everything. The judgment of the enemy is already done, and he has already been proven guilty of murder with the crucifixion of Christ. But what about us? I'm sure the angels are still watching how God solves the sin problem concerning us. We have been made a theater, not only to man, but to angels as well. Now some of you might remember those words of Christ when he said in Matthew 10 and verse 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. But a similar thing that Jesus says concerning the same scenario, he also mentions in Revelation 3 and verse 5. But I bet some of you didn't realize something very interesting that he adds. He says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So in Matthew 10 and verse 33, he says, Those who deny him, he will deny in front of his Father, but in Revelation 3 and verse 5, those who overcome, he will confess his name before his Father and his angels. Angels have a part in this judgment process. Jesus has some persuading to do. Those of us who overcome sin, our names are confessed not only before God the Father, but also before the angels of God. Why? Because again, the angels don't know everything, so they need to be reconciled about us and that God's judgment is just and that He is 100% right about who gets to go to heaven and who deserves the punishment. Luke 12 and verses 8 and 9. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man 
also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. The angels of God are watching as the judgment is taking place because they want to be 100% sure that God's judgment is just and that he is 100% right about who gets to go to heaven and who deserves the punishment. Luke 15, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Angels are even joyful when sinners repent. Clearly the cases of our lives are being reviewed by angels in heaven. The judgment taking place in heaven is the second stage of the judgment process and it is not to inform God about who on earth can have the reward of eternal life because God knows everything. The purpose of this second stage of the judgment taking place in heaven is to inform the angels that those who repent can have the reward of eternal life. Angels are not all-knowing like God is all-knowing. So God needs to show the angels in heaven how he deals with sin and who on earth can have eternal life through repentance. Revelation 22 verses 10 and 11 says, Seal not the saying of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Once the second stage of the judgment in heaven is concluded, it will then be time for God to reward those repentant sinners with eternal life. All who are righteous will stay righteous still, and all who are filthy will stay filthy still. There will be no more second chances prior to the second coming. James 2 and Revelation 22 says that people will be rewarded according to the works propelled by their faith. The reward of eternal life will be given to us at the second coming of Jesus Christ and not at the moment we die. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4 verses 6 through 8, notice that Paul never states that he will get his crown of righteousness at the moment of death. He says that he will get his crown of righteousness at that day at his appearing which is the appearing of Jesus Christ. Not to Paul only, but to all who have loved Christ's appearing. Now we already know the righteous will reign with Jesus Christ a thousand years and judgment is given to them. So judgment is given to the righteous. This is the third stage of the judgment. This is why we will reign with Christ a thousand years, because we need to do our own investigation. Now you say, no way. That's God's job, not ours. Now let me ask, when we get to heaven, will we be shocked that some of our friends and family will not make it? God is going to have to show us the transcript of our families and friends' lives who didn't make it to heaven to show us that they were lawbreakers, they never repented, and they did not accept Christ as their Savior. We are going to have to look at their lives and judge for ourselves why they didn't get the privilege of joining us in heaven. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 1 through 3 says that not only will we judge the world, which are the wicked at this point, who are left sleeping on a desolate earth awaiting their punishment, we also will judge angels, wicked angels. We won't be judging the angels that are in heaven. They do not need to be judged because they did not rebel. The judgment is what God will show us so that we are 100% sure that those who are wicked and even those angels who are wicked deserve the punishment of death. Why does God do this? Well, we need to be convinced before God initiates the punishment for the wicked because if we are not 100% convinced, then God cannot punish the wicked. This is justice and we are the jury. God is so just that he wants us to be totally sure that he is right before even initiating the punishment. Revelation 20 says that we will reign a thousand years and judgment will be given to us again because we need to be convinced that God made the right call and the rest of the dead will not be resurrected until after the thousand years have ended and we have reviewed God's 
judgment. The book of Revelation also mentions that the dead will stand before God. Now if the dead are truly dead, how do they stand before God? Remember, God has records of all of our lives written in heaven. He opens those books, which are the written transcripts of the lives of the wicked in order to judge those individuals. How do we know? Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So the wicked dead do not literally stand before God because they are dead. They stand before God through the record of their lives written in the books. Don't forget that 1 Corinthians 6 says that we, the saints, will judge the world. Paul even goes on to say, Know ye not that we shall judge angels. God will allow us to double check his judgment, not in order to correct him, but in order for us to be 100% convinced and assured that God was right in every single case of the judgment process. Why? Because there will be people in heaven whom we were just sure would not be in heaven, and there will be people who are not in heaven whom we were just sure would be in heaven. But by the end of that judgment, we will have no choice but to say, Lord, you are right. Everybody that is here is supposed to be here, and everybody who is not here, we now know that you gave them all the opportunity in the world to be here, but they rejected you. So by this time, we have noticed three of four stages of the judgment process. God had to first judge the devil and his wicked angels to assure the heavenly angels that the wicked angels deserve to be punished. In the second stage of the judgment, God had to judge mankind to assure the heavenly angels that those who obey the gospel and confess the name of Christ should be taken to heaven and those who are wicked breakers of the law and never repented deserve to be punished. In the third stage of the judgment, the saints have to be convinced that God was right about every case of every man and angel who have sinned. After the saints and heavenly angels are convinced that all of the wicked human beings and wicked angels deserve capital punishment, it is then time for the fourth stage of the judgment. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now there are a lot of things going on in this passage. Remember the wicked died by the seven last plagues and by the brightness of the coming of Christ. The righteous go to reign and judge with Christ in heaven a thousand years. And in that same thousand years, we have just read that the devil is bound. How is he bound? When someone is bound, it means that they don't have the freedom to do whatever it is that they want to do. What does the devil mainly do? He deceives people and campaigns against God. If the righteous are in heaven and the wicked are dead, there is nobody on this desolate earth for the devil to deceive. Therefore he is bound for a thousand years until, verse 3 of Revelation 20 says, the thousand years have been fulfilled and he will be loosed again for a season. Why so? Because the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. We will notice even more when we read further the reason why the devil is loose again after the thousand years are finished. Revelation 20 verses 7 and 8. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So the devil was bound a thousand years because the righteous were up in heaven and the wicked were dead. He had no one to deceive. He is then loose again after the thousand years are finished because the rest of the dead, which are the wicked, have now resurrected and the devil again has 
people he can deceive. Revelation 20 verses 13 through 15, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The sea gave up the dead, and death and hell, which is the grave, also gave up the dead. This is the second resurrection. And right before those wicked who have just resurrected were thrown into the lake of fire, the Bible says that they were judged every man according to their works. Wait a minute. Another judgment? The heavenly angels have already went through the first stage of the judgment and were convinced that the devil and the wicked angels deserve the punishment. They also already went through the second stage of the judgment and were convinced that the righteous people have a right to be in heaven and also that the wicked people deserve the punishment of death. We also have just learned that when the righteous go to heaven, they reign with Christ a thousand years where they go through the third stage of the judgment, being convinced that the righteous in heaven have a right to be in heaven and the wicked who are not found in heaven but are still left dead on a desolate earth deserve the punishment. The wicked angels already know that they are doomed and God knows everything. Every party involved except for one already know and are 100% convinced that God made the right judgment call in each and every case. Well, who else needs to be convinced? Who are the only ones left who have not yet gone through the judgment process? None other than the wicked themselves. They are the only ones who are not yet convinced about their own case. When the wicked resurrect, the Bible says that they will be judged again not to convince God, the heavenly angels, or the saints, but to convince the wicked themselves that they deserve the punishment of death. The wicked must know why they will be punished. Again, Revelation 20 says that the wicked were judged according to their works, which is really a reflection of their law-breaking or sin and unwillingness to repent. The wicked will have to be convinced that God judged them correctly. In fact, Jude verses 14 and 15 mentions that Enoch prophesied about the wicked in those days, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is why Paul says in Romans 14 about the judgment, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every knee shall bow. Even the wicked will bow and confess that God made the right decision and that they deserve the punishment of death. So after the saints go through the third stage of the judgment in heaven with Christ for a thousand years, the Lord, along with the saints, will come down from heaven to execute judgment to those who are ungodly to convict them of their ungodly deeds. Of course, this will be right after the wicked who have been dead and were left on earth for a thousand years are resurrected, and even they will bow and confess that God had made the right decision. Again, Revelation 20 says that after the thousand years are expired, Satan is back to his old deceptive ways. He shall go out to deceive the nations to gather them to battle. Right when the Lord, along with the saints, are coming down from heaven, Satan starts deceiving the wicked who have just resurrected and recruiting them for battle. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Right when all of the wicked were about to attack the camp of the saints, which is the city of the New Jerusalem, God rains fire and brimstone to devour them all. We will come back to this in a minute. All of this happens while the New Jerusalem has not yet landed on earth and touched the ground. How do we know? Because after all of this happens, John says in Revelation 12 and verses 1 and 2, 
And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new heaven and the new earth are made after the wicked are punished, and then the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. Now let's deal with this fire and brimstone that devours the wicked. Let me ask, when did hell begin? Let me rephrase that question. When will hell begin? Where is it going to be? And how long will it last? I'm sorry to say, and I say this in the most humble way, but I believe that the natural mainstream Christian response would not be very consistent with Scripture. I know that there probably still remains some unsatisfied individuals with more questions about the sequence of things concerning life, death, what they don't understand about what happens after death, their unbelief of the sleep we must endure in the grave, and the authenticity of a coming resurrection at a certain time in the future. What about the thief on the cross? What about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? What about the near-death experiences? We will answer all these things later on. But remember what we have already learned so far and have proven carefully using Scripture alone. Life is given to us as a free gift from God. Death is a result of our unfaithfulness to God. When we die, we really die, and we wait in the grave, sleeping the sleep of death until we are resurrected at the second coming of Christ. There are four stages of the judgment. The first stage of the judgment was to prove to the heavenly hosts that Satan and his angels are guilty of sin and deserve the punishment of death. The second stage is to prove to the heavenly angels who among men deserve the punishment of death and who belongs in heaven with God. After this stage, then is the second coming of Jesus Christ, where He will resurrect the dead in Christ to be taken up in the air and rapture those who are alive who believe in Christ. Also at the second coming of Christ, the wicked who are living will be destroyed by the brightness of His coming, and the wicked dead are already dead, and they will all be left on earth unburied while the saints go to heaven to reign with Christ a thousand years to commence the third stage of the judgment. This third stage is for the saints to be convinced that God, of course, made the right decision about each and every case concerning men and angels. When this judgment is done, then we will all with God come down from heaven and the fourth and last stage of the judgment will begin. In this fourth stage, the wicked will be resurrected and they will also need to know that they are guilty and of course, every knee will bow and say that God is right about every individual case. Then the Bible says that when every case have been decided, those who are wicked will be thrown in the lake of fire. This is hell. Now God is love, says 1 John 4 and verse 8. God will not send people to hell unless every one of us, including the fallen angels and the wicked, agree that God was right in every individual case. Justice then needs to be served when everybody is convinced and convicted about who deserves the punishment of hellfire. What a just God. So if the dead remain in the grave until the resurrection and the burning of the wicked does not happen until after the millennium and after the fourth stage of the judgment, then we can only conclude that hell is not burning right now. Of course, it is obvious. The punishment does not take place until everybody is 100% sure. Every passage in the Bible that talks about a place of burning for the wicked always refers to the lake of fire at the very end of the world, except for one passage.